All right. All right. Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's good to see you. It's good to be back, actually, um, here at the headquarters. And um, hope you had uh, at least a productive three weeks in the Lord, staying in the Word, praying. And uh, as uh, St. Richard of Chichester put it, may we uh, know him more clearly, follow him more nearly, and love him more dearly. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good. You like that? I wish I could claim that, but... So let's have a word of prayer and um, thank God for what we have here. Lord, we thank you now for providing for us food today, uh, food for our bodies, and also food for our souls through your word. We ask that you bless us, enrich us, enlighten the eyes of our understanding, and that you will produce fruit through us that will ultimately glorify yourself. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, thank you. Uh, Raisha, Rashida, is it? Raisha? <laughs> That's a joke. It's Raisha. And, uh, and, yeah. That's the last time she'll ever answer my phone. <laughs> so uh, last uh, last time we talked three weeks ago, and uh, what I wanted to do, I thought would be good, is to start from where uh, don't don't pick up right where I left off, but kind of go over a little bit of what we went over last time and clear some things up and then move on to chapter 29. And we're in Genesis 29 for those of you who uh, this may be your first time here. So we talked last time about mountaintop prophecy. And if you remember what I said is that in my view, prophets in the Old Testament did not see the age that we're in right now uh, or the time period that we're in right now. This is my understanding that uh, prophets in the Old Testament saw prophecy about Israel and what's going to happen to Israel. Uh, my view is that um, God is still dealing with Israel right now. There's no hard stop dispensation, in other words, where he stops. He still works with everybody and everybody's soul, except he, oh, could you close that for somebody? Except that what he's done is he's instituted, uh, he's turned to the Gentiles, which are non-Jews at this point, because of the rejection. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. That's John 1.12, if you remember that. So what happens is uh, prophets, they would see events on the horizon which pertain to Israel, but down in the valleys, they wouldn't see what's going on there. And I, in my view, at least, Chapman Fields, we're in a valley right now that the uh, prophets could not see. And so that's, we call it, you call it the church age or whatever you, age of grace. I'm not sure if that's a good term, but anyway, the church. And um, they didn't quite see that. Now, so we, I, I showed you... Uh, Daniel, 70 weeks. We talked about that a little bit in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. 70 weeks have been decreed, and he goes on to talk about what's going to happen in those 70 weeks. Uh, I, t I told you that, in my view, each week uh, stood for a period of seven years. Uh, and I, I don't have enough time to get into that, but there are other scriptures in the Bible, to me at least, that would indicate in this prophetic announcement that each week is a period of seven years. And so uh, 70 weeks... From the time that uh, Daniel was talking about, um, let's see. That's not it. Okay. From the time, the Holy, to finish the transgression, and then it says 70 weeks. Uh, so, in order to know, discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and build Jerusalem, and I think that was uh, happened at 445 BC by sight. Not Cyrus. Well, Cyrus was one of them. Actually, there were, I think, four different uh, times where the kings of Persia let the Jews go back. This is the last one, I believe, by Artaxerxes, 445. By the way, have any, anyone ever here seen the movie 300? Yes. You remember that the, the guy Xerxes, that, that the god or the so-called uh, demigod, I guess what you call him, that was uh, the Persian king. He was that would have been the husband of Esther, Xerxes during that time. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. But uh, so he let him go, and basically 70 weeks, so 490, 360, 490 years until uh, uh, the 70th week. And so uh, that's all that uh, Daniel would see. This is actually, so from the time that the Jews were told they could go back and rebuild the city up until the time of Christ rode into Jerusalem on a donkey on uh, Palm Sunday, was 483 years, and then there's a break. You notice um, uh, Daniel talked about 
seven weeks and 62 weeks. Um, and then after the 62 weeks, so that's ac actually after 69 weeks, I'm going to get, I'm gonna get <laughs> this is going to get bad again here. Uh, Messiah will be cut off. And that was the time when he wrote in and he was rejected and crucified. And then if you noticed, they talk about the 70th week, but between the 69th and the 70th week, um, here I go back. Okay. There's uh, nothing talked about here. So he was cut off. And then it talks about what's going to happen in that 70th week right here. So in my opinion, again, there's different ways of looking at this, too. Um, uh, when you get into eschatology, which is a study of end things and final things, I mean, interpretations run the gamut. And, uh, and so there's many different ways of looking at this. I, I've looked at this in many different ways. This one makes the most sense with me, at least, that Dan, uh, Daniel's prophecy. He also, Daniel was also, there's been liberal commentators have accused the book of Daniel as having been written um, like around the year two, uh, I think 100 or 200 BC, when actually it was it was written long before that. Um, Daniel was uh, one of the called the exilic chaplains because uh, chaplains exilic prophets because he was pro prophesying during the exile, which was uh, between uh, which is around 586 BC. But he has so He's been so accurate in his uh, prophecy that many liberal commentators today believe that it could not have been written that time because he talked about the four kingdoms that were to come, um, which were uh, Babylon, uh, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And uh, that's in other parts of Daniel. And so this is very interesting that, uh, uh, that they would do that because they don't believe there's no way he could have known this is going to happen. But I believe God gave him this information. And so what happened there? So, and then we talked a little bit about uh, the seven feasts in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus and how each of them uh, correspond to, a, uh, to Jesus and his death, resurrection, and burial, how he sent the Holy Spirit. And then later, there's a, there's a long period between the spring Fest, uh, the spring festivals and the fall festivals, we call it the summer period, where there's not much going on, which I believe where we are right now. And then later, there was the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, which is the High Holy Day. And finally, the Feast of Tabernacles, where they bring everybody together, which I take to be the millennium. Now, again, there are many other ways of looking at this. This is one of them. The only reason I bring this up is because we have been talking about um, uh, covenants. And we talked about the old and the new covenant. And so um, uh, we talked about how that in the old covenant, Mosaic covenant, uh, righteousness was attained by works. Uh, but then in the new covenant, uh, works was done away with, and it's all by grace at that point. Jesus Christ. So we'll go back. So we talked about, so the whole bit about covenants was about law and grace. As Galatians says, Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman, one by the free woman. And but the son of, and who was the, uh, who was the bondwoman in this case? Hagar and the free woman was Sarah. Sarah. And so the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. What does that mean? Is that we believe we have to get involved in things, redouble our efforts, push our agenda ahead of God's and do what we think we need to do in order to work the works of God. And so Abraham got ahead of God, just like Moses got ahead of God. What did Moses do? He killed an Egyptian, right? Because he thought that uh, that's what his calling was. Well, it was, but he got out ahead of God. He was supposed to do that later, and God was going to do it in the Red Sea, remember? That's right. So Abraham got ahead of God and said, well, I can see that I'm supposed to have a son, I better hurry and make this happen because I see God's not going to make it happen. And so pushed his agenda ahead of God's, and it caused all kinds of problems. He was born according to the flesh, but the son of the free woman through the promise. God said, no, I have my way. You're getting ahead of me. Uh, you've messed us up, but I can still, you know, I, can, I will have my way no matter what. And the promise was going to happen through Isaac. And so through Isaac, the promise was brought. This is allegorically speaking. An allegory is um, is when something happens and then it, it points to something else, basically. So it's a um, it points back or forward to something else. 
These women are two covenants. That's what we were talking about, the covenants this whole time, the old and the new. One proceeding from Mount Sinai, and that's Mount Sinai, well, what many people believe Mount Sinai is right there, bearing children who are to be slaves, she is Hagar. This, is ha this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem where she is in slavery with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, and you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. So what, what, what Paul was saying here is to the church in Galatia, um, the church in Galatia was one of the first churches uh, first churches to be established, and uh, I believe Galatians was uh, the first letter to be written. And the huge problem there were these Judaizers, these Jews that would come and would tell the church that uh, yeah, it's okay, I see where you have accepted this Messiah, but you know you have to follow the law of Moses in order to continue in this. You need to be circumcised and do everything Moses told you. And so Paul had to deal with this. He had to write letters and go, no, these people are wrong. If you start by grace, you continue in grace, and you finish in grace. It's all by grace. And, but what was happening in Jerusalem, they were going back to works. They started out in grace, but they always go back to works because what, did I, what have I said before? Left to our own devices, we'll always go back to the physical. The physical will always win out over the spiritual because you can count and compare the physical and manipulate the physical. You can't do that with grace or the spiritual. So what was happening is uh, between law and grace and the two covenants, the one covenant was a covenant of works, which was supposed to bring them to the point where they realized they never could keep the law. What the Pharisees would do interestingly enough, was they would bend the law to make it so that they could appear to be keeping the law. That's what the Pharisees would do. They'd actually uh, do little things in the law and make, uh, anybody ever heard of the oral law? You ever heard of the oral tradition? The oral law was a law that supposedly was given to Moses at Mount Sinai by God to explain the written law, and it was passed down generation to generation through the sages and through the rabbis up to the time of, uh, um, and so this was, it was an oral law. In other words, the law said that you shall not work on the Sabbath. What does that mean, work? Well, they believed that God gave Moses an oral law to explain what work was. And so uh, this went all the way through uh, AD 200 until the point where the Jews saw they were going to be scattered and that oral law would not be able to be uh, told again by anyone. So they wrote it down, and it's now called the Gemara. Uh, the Mishnah, you ever heard of the Mishnah, Gemara, or the Talmud? It's like it's like this huge. If you if you buy the whole series, you know the law is about this thin, but the oral law is about this big. And so um, what would happen is these Pharisees they would come up with these, um, they would bend the laws to make it look like they were actually keeping the law because they thought that was the way to God. But the new covenant that would come, as in Jeremiah 31, said that I will write my law on your heart. Remember that? It's no longer external conformity to the law. Now it's an internal transformation. That's Jeremiah 31. And so the new covenant is the free. The Jerusalem above is the free. She is our mother, and you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. So once you have made the transition from the line of Adam and you come over to the line of Christ, you are now in the new covenant. You see, when you were, when you were born physically, you were in the line of Adam. You're your heritage was Adam. Your, uh, your identity was with the law of works. And your destiny was with uh, separation from God forever. But when you made that transportation, transformation and trusted in Christ according to the New Testament, you have now moved from that line over into another family line. Now your family is God. You have a purpose uh, on this earth to glorify him and your ultimately the ultimate destiny is with him forever it's amazing how this works you're taken out of one family and put in another it's extraordinary and no no person would have ever come up with this plan before the plans that you and me come up with have to do with the do's and don'ts and here's a checklist if you do the do's and don't do the don'ts you're in that's our plan and that's this plan that that old covenant of the law the new covenant is God says, no, I'll do this for you. And it's by grace. And it's on the inside, not on the outside. Okay. So how do you appropriate a relationship with God then? Well, according to Genesis, again, uh, the Mosaic covenant was appropriated by works. And so if you wanted to be blessed, 
and you wanted uh, God's blessing on your life, and, and you wanted his face to shine upon you, then you did what he told you to do. Of course, they found out soon they, could never, they were going to fail at this. And uh, one, of the, one of the reasons God did this, I think, is to show them that uh, it wasn't in themselves to produce this or to come up with salvation. They had to look somewhere else. And it was uh, at that point, that would be Christ. However, the Abrahamic covenant appropriated a relationship with God by faith. Genesis 15, 6 says what? Anybody know that? You know, Robert, don't you? Moses, I mean, Abraham believed God and he counted it unto him for righteousness. What happened in Genesis 22? That's the akeda means to bind. That's the Hebrew word means to bind. What happened in Genesis 22? Anybody know? How did Abraham prove his faith? He, he went to, he bound Isaac and it was, it was just about to sacrifice him. Exactly. But he could not have done Genesis 22 unless he had Genesis 15. Now, here's where most people get it wrong. Listen to me. It's very important. This is intimacy before activity. Most people think activity will lead to intimacy. Wow. If I go to church, if I do all the right things, if, I, if I'm out doing all the things church is telling me to do, telling people about Jesus, if I'm, or whatever it is your church tells you to do, if I'm doing all this stuff, it will ultimately lead to intimacy with God. The Bible shows us that he believed God it was an intimate relationship with God first that led to this binding that, that he could actually offer his son. You see the difference? What, what most people do is that Oswald Chambers once put it like this. Perhaps the greatest enemy of our devotion to God is our service to God. Let me say that one more time. Perhaps the greatest enemy of our devotion to God is our service to God. If, do you hear what I'm saying? You think you're out there. You think by doing this and by being busy, I will become closer to God. It's, it's actually the opposite. And, and the Mary Martha principle proves this. In Luke 10, where Jesus was at the house of, Mary, of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and he was eating dinner, and Mary was sitting at his feet, and Martha was out busy taking care of the, the food. And, uh, and Martha says, Lord, don't you care that my sister's sitting there in front of you? Not helping me out, and we got all the stuff to do. He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried about many things, but only one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen that one thing that shall not be taken away from her, and that is time at the feet of our Lord. That's what she said. Now, I, don't, I do not discount works. Don't get me wrong, but it needs to be put in its proper context and order. Intimacy before activity. Amen. You got that? That's important. So you spend time with him. My take on this is this. The more time you spend with him, the more he will work through you. It's true. And you don't, it's almost like you don't even have to force it, to force this issue, right? He will automatically, because of you connecting with him, and you're the branch connecting into the vine, that vine will flow through you automatically. And what's at the end of that branch? Fruit. fruit. It's yeah, excess yeah. life. It's that life that flows through you, and then there's fruit. See, most of us think by getting the fruit, will become connected to the vine. The truth is, when you connect yourself to the vine, you will produce fruit. That's right. Follow me on this? I just want you to see, get this. Uh, the Bible is, is full of this kind of stuff, by the way. Um, where am I? Okay, so in Genesis 29.2, um, the scripture says, what time is it? There? So I can keep up. 23. I got some time. Okay. So Genesis 29.2, let's move on now. Yeah. So what's happening? Well, Joseph went on his journey, came to the land of the people of the East. Now, this is after, is this after Esau? Yeah. See? Is this after Esau? I'm trying to look and see. Is this after the meeting of Jacob and Esau? Or not? And remember, he's, he's running from, it's before. The rest of the All right. This is after, Okay. Oh, I see. This is after the wrestling match with God. Okay, so God finally got a hold of him. And, um, and Jacob went on his journey, chapter 29 says, and came to the land of the people of the east. And, and he looked. 
And he looked and saw a well in the field. And behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. And it talks about what happened. All the flocks would be gathered. They would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and they put the stone back in its place. And, um, and so the well is a picture. The fact that a meeting place took meeting place was at a well was significant. Was, a well was an indication of God's blessing at that point. Or, yeah, God's blessing. There's a picture of a well with a rock on it right there. Um, and then uh, I, there's some other scriptures right there if you want to look at, at wells in the Bible. I think that's the only thing I have on that. So 4, four through 12 says, And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We're from Haran. Now, if I had a map, I'd show you where that is, but it's up way north. It'd be modern day, uh, up near modern day Turkey right now, way north of Syria, or maybe up in Syria. But no, it's way up near Turkey. That's where it is. And uh, that's where, if you remember, uh, Abraham journeyed, and his father died, and then God told him to go on down. So all of his people were basically there. You see what I'm saying? That, so he's asking, where are you from? And they said, we're from Haran. He said to them, do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, we know him. So he said to them, is he well? And they, they said, he's well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with a sheep. And he said, look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to gather together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. It came to pass when Jacob and Rachel saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebecca's son. So she ran and told her father. So now he has come into contact with some of his own people here. He had been fleeing from Esau, but now he was looking for a bride. After this encounter with God, this is what, and this goes back to what I was just talking about. He was pushing things. He was trying to be deceptive. He was trying to be crafty and do everything possible to do what he thought that God wanted him to do. Instead of relying on the power of God, he relied on his own power and his own instinct. But what's happened is after the transfer to transformation now, now he's moved from trusting in himself to trusting in God. He, he, would, he had been fleeing from Esau, but now he's looking for a bride. This change in purpose was due to God's promise given to him at that where he wrestled with him at Bethel. His quest was now the fulfillment of part of that promise, namely the seed. And so like Abraham told him, and God told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you're, we're going to give him a land, a blessing, and a seed. The seed would come through Jacob. And that was the seed that would ultimately bring the new covenant. Jacob's spirit was now magnanimous and unselfish. He had a new outlook. And so he knew even though things were happening to them, it, it didn't seem right, that God did not have his best interest at heart. Ultimately, he changed and saw, you know what? I'm going to allow God to work in my life no matter what happens. He had no regrets for the past, but he did learn from it. He was not going to worry about the future anymore, but he still was going to plan. But he wanted to be alive in the moment. And this is good for us to remember. A lot of times we are crucified between two thieves, two criminals, regret for the past and worry for the future. And it's, it's, it's good to remember and reflect that you should have no regret for the past, but you should learn from it. It should make you a different person. You should have no worries about the future, but still plan. It, the, the Bible talks about a, pl a plan. Let God, allow God, have a plan, but hold on to it with a loose enough grip so that if God wants to change it, he can, basically. And then be alive in the moment. Because most of us are not, most of us are even, are either thinking about the past or the future, but we're not alive in the moment. Have you ever gone out to lunch with someone and uh, instead of spending time with them in the moment, you're thinking about what you're going to do that afternoon or what you have done that morning and you're not really in the moment with them because we live and we live right on the margin. We fill our day up with so many things that we have no time for anyone else. Did you ever notice how Jesus structured his time to make relationships, but we structure our time to accomplish tasks? 
And he always, Jesus always had time for somebody. Tugging at his coat or something. Always had time for somebody. He left enough time in his day. And he was never in a hurry. He was never rushing anywhere. And he always had enough time for people. That's, I think that's how we should be alive in the moment just like that. That'd be a great uh, All shall work together for good according to Romans 8.28. Everything is needful that he sends. Nothing can be needful that he withholds. That's John Newton. What song did John Newton write? Amazing Grace. That's right. All shall work together for good. Everything is needful that he sends. Nothing can be needful that he withholds. No good thing that he withholds from those who walk uprightly. That's what the scripture says. So, uh, and then finally, uh, in John, John 11, 15, I thought this was interesting. I'll probably end on this. Let's see. Is that, is that, okay. Yeah, that's right there on time. In John 11, 15, this is the story of Jesus. Remember I was just talking about Mary and Martha? Their brother had died, Lazarus. Remember that? And this is interesting. You know, you, you gloss over this. You, you go over it fast and you miss it sometimes. But in John 11, 15, Mary and Martha were really upset at Jesus because they knew if he had been there, he had healed all so many other people. If he had been there, he could have healed his, her bro, their brother. And that the disciples were probably wondering why he wasn't in a hurry to get there. And Jesus said, Lord, uh, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Jesus said to them plainly that Lazarus is dead. He said, Lazarus is dead. Now, he wasn't anywhere near Lazarus. And 15 says, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe, nevertheless go to him. I want to leave you with this. He said he was glad that Lazarus died. Have you ever thought about that before? Why would you? What a terrible thing to say. I'm glad he's dead. I'm glad I wasn't there. That's what he said. I'm glad I'm not there for your sake, because he knew what was going to happen, right? He knew the end, but th these guys didn't. In order to increase the faith of the disciples, he had to do this. Someone had to die. And, and it was, la unfortunately, it was Lazarus, but he, he did bring them back to life. He resuscitated them. And I think it's important to remember in our own lives. There are things happen in your life that, that you think, you wrestle with God about whether this looks like your best interest or not. Yeah. And a lot of times God is probably glad it's happening to you. Because he needs to bring you to a place in your life in order to make you into the person he always That's intended right. you to be. And it's, sometimes it's hard for us. But apparently, Jesus was glad that he was not there to save the day because he knew in the end it would be even better. It was something better. And so what does that mean to us today? No matter what you're going through right now, the scripture says that... Um, it is not to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed to you later. You hear that? <clears throat> Everything you're going through right now has a purpose. And believe me, believe, I believe, and I'll end with a statement. I believe personally that five minutes in the presence of God, after five minutes, you would say, you know what? I'd go down on that earth. I'd do another 80 years just to be five minutes in the presence of God. Yes. Again. I honestly believe that. Yes. That's how much glory I think is going to be revealed to us at that point. So, any questions, uh, comments, concerns there? Anything at all? Okay, so uh, we'll, we're back on track now, right? Every Tuesday and uh, lunch right here. Tell your friends. Um, let's see, we'll go over hot coals later. <laughs> I was ready for that. All right, so let's have a word of prayer then. Lord, we thank you now that you've shown us. Through the old and new covenants, Lord, how before it was external, but to how you put it on the inside of us now. Lord, help us to not ever go back to that again, a checklist living, Lord, but to rely on your grace. Understanding that there are some things in our life that are going to happen that we may not agree with you, but knowing that in the end, all will come out in exactly the same way that you wanted it, Lord all through your glory, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.